My name is Joe Carnes and the co-founder here. So I have been in blockchain for many, many years, uh, dating back to like 2013, 2014, when Bitcoin was $3. And I built mining rigs. I was really into crypto. I had 13 machines running in my basement at one time and then got into um banking. I have some finance background. I worked for Wells Fargo Bank. And as this rise of the DeFi you know, category within crypto really started exploding about a year ago, uh, we started looking closer at how can we take our real world business, so to speak, which is WID, and take that expertise and the strong partnerships we had in big data and translate that and migrate it into a decentralized blockchain-driven company that could be revolutionary in a way that not only would we have this huge identity graph and enable users to own and monetize their own data instead of the tech giants controlling and stealing their data, basically, but also do so in a decentralized way where instead of having to have a profit motive at the center of that equation where perhaps only 10 or 15% of all the revenue could flow back to the end users where it belongs in this decentralized space, 100% of the, of the revenue can flow back to the end users. So that's what we set out to do. And we think we have the perfect recipe of, you know, a big disruptive idea on the real big data company side but using DeFi as the launch vehicle to get us to the moon. So what are the problems in the, uh, the data um, industry that uh, Swap is actually ha happening to, to solve? Because data is a very complicated um, kind of like industry. There's so many owners and different layers right. to that. And that's a great question. And it's very easy to answer. So today you will see, you will see a hundred ads over 100 ads, every single person on earth, on average, sees 100 ads per day, but you get paid zero. So the problem is you get paid zero, okay? And so we take for granted the fact that we are the product for the tech giants and that we think we're getting these free tools and Gmail and stuff from them, but they're still making you know $1.2 trillion per year collectively. And there's about eight or 10 of these big bloated middlemen in the data economy. They stand between the advertisers who want to run ads to targeted audiences and us who are the product. So we have uh, our own data, our tracking data, the websites we go to, apps we have installed, things we do online. And people are just giving that away for free. And they don't even understand how much value that is. So that is the problem. And what we solve is taking those big bloated middlemen in between us and the advertisers and that $1.2 trillion per year in the data monetization industry and break it up just like what Uber did to the taxi cab industry. They completely turned it upside down because instead of having cab unions charging huge fees for medallions that have to go on taxi cabs and all that bloated middlemen stuff, we remove that and we simply connect the end user who has the data in your phone and for you to simply install, authorize, and earn. So it's actually very similar to what Brave Browser does. I don't know if you use Brave, but you, you, it, they built it off of the Chrome interface. So it's like Chrome Browser, but mm -hmm. it blocks all the ads and they say, hey, just do what you normally would be doing and we'll start paying you tokens. And the way that they're doing that is, is for people who press a button in the browser and say, yes, I accept you to show me some ads if, as long as it's within reason. As, as long as you see a few ads a day, they, they start paying you in their Ethereum-based tokens, similar to what we would be doing. So in our system, it's a much wider ecosystem because with Brave, they're only tracking what you're doing in that browser. In our ecosystem, users install the smartphone app. They'll see a list of their social media accounts, bank accounts, credit card accounts, anything they have that they feel comfortable opting in to share. They can authorize those. And that means that they are fully opting in to share with us an encrypted version of a much wider range of data that our graph then layers on top of each other, which means that ultimately 
this won't just be the first decentralized identity graph in the world. It will be the largest, bigger than Facebook, bigger than Google, because they can they only have their sources to pull from and they can try and create other partnerships and things. But ours is fully opted in. So they use these sneaky tactics to, to try and get people's data, whereas ours, the only reason someone would install our app is to knowing that they're entering into a basically a deal where they're naming swap as their, their licensed data broker, essentially. And it all happens you know, automatically with uh, the smart contract. But that's essentially what's happening. They install, they authorize their accounts, and then they start earning tokens in exchange for their data. And they're earning the equivalent of 100% of the data monetization revenue. We're not standing in the middle of it because this is now totally decentralized and everyone in the community that owns these tokens is now participating in the ownership and utility of the ecosystem. Yeah, um, a couple things additional. Um, for the people currently at Hobby ID, we see uh, that every day we receive as every other data management company with, uh, from our partners or they receive from us what people search on the internet, what you talk, uh, your uh, Siri and every voice search optimization or these uh, features in the marketing comes out just because this tracked information about the person is so much right now uh, you get as a data management company and then you compile it, sell it to brands. Hey, yesterday he talked about Nike. Here's your guy. He wants Nike. Go advertise him. Now, why if person wouldn't exist, that data wouldn't be there. And this market of $1.4 trillion market wouldn't be in place when these huge data management companies, Google's, Facebook's, everybody monetizing over it. And why if person shouldn't be getting compensated? I am the raw material. Why wouldn't I get paid? I am doing my search, I am talking about it, I am bringing that to you. Uh, some can argue, as Joe said, hey, we are giving you free product. Oh, that free product doesn't cost anything in comparison to what you are making. It's uh, uh, from that uh, standpoint. And besides that, put the monetization aside, what about my privacy rights? What about I don't want anybody to sell my data? Right. There is no tool exists to do that. That's the swap comes into play. So how does that work? So it would be any kind of like information or any kind of like apps on my phone only or, or on my computer? Uh, let's see. It's you actually. install the app here on your phone. You, uh, you, you get a picture. notification, location service, uh, and then you enter the information. Is, if app is the free, in most cases, uh, I mean, I would say 98% of the cases that app is free because they are collecting location data. They are collecting different types of verified data on your phone, and they are going to sell it uh, in the different marketplaces. You can go to any marketplace. You can see Outlook app. You can see any app. Just tell me any app. I can show you where to buy the data about that app legally. And you signing your rights to them when you are installing it. In swap, you're gonna select the swap as a data, uh, your legal guardian of your data rights. And we have a reserve even if any company doesn't want to comply with that, we can sue them okay. with that reserved money. So to protect your data rights. Can I show my screen? This, this picture sums it all up and it makes it very easy to understand. Yeah. Uh, can, can I? Show my screen. I need the rights. Now we are talking about rights. Let's do. <laughs> okay, go are you consent now? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So can you see the screen here? Mm -hmm. This so so this picture kind of says it all. This is what a user would see when they log in. And in each country, it's going to be a little bit different because obviously not all these US banks and things, credit cards, American Express. Um, are in all the countries, may have your local bank there. But the idea is the same. So while this might seem a little scary at first, that, well, I'm going to be logging into my shopping app, this Ibotta, they, bas they basically give people huge savings and coupons to go to the shopping, you know, to go to the grocery store or Walmart. 
And in exchange for them giving you discounts, they track everything you purchase. They're basically scanning your receipt. And that's incredibly powerful at the advertiser level because they could say, hey, I sell this beer or this toothpaste or whatever the product is. And those advertisers can target people who they know buy their competitor's product. So they're in market to buy that particular product. So that shopping app alone, if someone connects this, then yes, you're sharing what that company is collecting on you. But instead of you earning nothing, you then get put into the equation, the earning equation of these apps. So even though it's kind of scary to think about all these companies are tracking you, well, they are. And so therefore, since they're tracking you already, wouldn't it be better to start getting paid for that? Now, there's going to be some percentage of people who just don't want to be tracked at all. We don't think it's going to be very many because people like getting paid. So it's probably going to be somewhere like 5, 10, maybe 12% of people that want to use our app for the, the, the opposite reason. So if a user installs it and they don't want to have anything to do with this and they want to say, you know what, just forget me. I want to become invisible. They can press a button and it basically it doesn't connect to any of these and instead sends a signal to the global opt-out databases that control GDPR and all these other things. And it, it erases them or it puts them on like the do not call list of emailing and tracking. So that may not be a permanent fix, but that is the is the most privacy protecting way that we can help users become as invisible as possible and be tracked as little as possible. So there's two really two options when you log in. Also, and additionally, I want to mention uh, first quick thing here, uh, adoption of this app, uh, while people know it, how you will come, since we are selling all that data on each person, every data management company, they usually have on average 200 piece of data. And then when you will verify your account, we're gonna uh, pre-fill all that information there. You just need to verify and to say which one is which is yours or not. And after that one, you can control that data or the you can monetize it. Additionally, we will have uh, browser extensions where all your behavior, now instead of abc.com selling your data, behavior data, now you will be owner of it. You can uh, sell it through the swap, that data and monetize it. In If you have a company, you wanna monetize company data as well. In that case, you can do in your profile company section. Uh, when it comes to the uh, this controlling the data, in Europe, it's really highly uh, much, they're, Regulated. they're a front runner in this one. Uh, they have uh, in Estonia, in different countries, I mean, if you send even one email without permission, your servers are going to get blocked. First hand, I know it because we have ESP as well. Uh, for our clients, a couple of times it happened, clients sent the email to the European you know, audience, our servers got blocked just from the standpoint that how control this because that person one time comes back and says, hey, I never signed up for this one. Now server providing company has an obligation to investigate. First they are blocking, then investigating, then you have to prove that no, you didn't, he was signed up or I'm gonna penalty, penalize my client, all these things. So it, they really taking it seriously. Right. But here in the US, uh, all those uh, data centers are available, but nobody controls. Uh, um, I can also see the phone contacts. For example, do you collect the phone contacts? And when I sign up or when I download the app, what kind of information do I have to put in? Is it uh, enabled by phone number or is it in, in uh, by phone yeah. or the email address? And then it is, I mean, you don't need, uh, we all are the, as soon as you put the, your email address, it will send you verification. We all already have your phone number and the email address. Right. But so it's just a verifier. First and foremost is the device ID or MAID that that recognizes the device itself and the phone number. And that's the most unique thing about a person because you could have two or three email addresses. Most people do. So we look at the device first. The other reason why it's important to look at the device first is to stop scammers from abusing the system. So imagine mm -hmm. if you could create a bot that made it look like you had 10,000 phones. So that's why you, focusing on the device ID first 
um, is how you're initially authenticated. No different than when you install Telegram on your phone or any app or even like a blockchain type wallet. It's linked to that device first. Right. And so mm-hmm. all of this information that would be passed is totally encrypted or hashed. So mm-hmm. <laughs> again, it seems scary to give away your phone contacts, but people don't even realize this. When you use Gmail, all your contacts are going to Google. And exactly, when you, yeah. if, if you've or ever even installed like LinkedIn, right? even LinkedIn, all mm-hmm. your business contacts are actually looked at, that LinkedIn app scans your phone and looks at all of your contacts and says, oh, who do you know in LinkedIn? And they're positioning it in a way that sounds friendly. Like, hey, let's see who you know on LinkedIn. But what that really is doing is giving them all your contacts. And onboarding them as a new, basically, uh, users. If they're not, oh, select all of them, invite them, or all these things are bringing to the point that, yep, you're pretending that you are doing it good for me and to try and connect me with everybody. But in reality, you are trying to get more people to collect more data and then launch an advertising platform inside it that, uh, oh, it's for advertisers. You can order run campaigns. Right. So uh, when anyone looks at this, it's start, like this part is the, is the shock. It's, it's the reality check of the state of the union as far as privacy and data goes, which is a little scary. So that's why it's important to kind of first educate ourselves on how this ecosystem works today so you can best determine how you want to use the app. Is it to become invisible or is it to monetize your data and start getting paid? No, this is, this is great. So um, my question is also, how about the voice uh, kind of like apps, audio apps, like WhatsApp or Telegram or even like Clubhouse? Uh, or does, does, for example, Swap listen or collects the data, um, kind of like the voice data, if it's, no. for example, if I'm talking on a phone no. or even the surrounding, no? No. And so, how about the WhatsApp? How about Yeah, so... We can't like so we have to use the legitimate API connections and fields made available to us from these partners. And they don't share all of the information because some of it they want to keep secret and proprietary to their platforms. So unfortunately, since uh, you know, Amazon's Alexa is listening to everything we say, if we have an integration with Amazon, they're not gonna pass that data to us because they won't share that with anyone. Unless we pay. Uh and uh, what about uh, Let's talk about Fitbit, your all health data. Yeah, what well, you're running, your Apple Watch and everything else, collecting all that data. But in reality, that data, uh, you can log in from here to your Fitbit ac- account. It will synchronize it. You can see the different, uh, even not just the collecting data, you can use it, those indicators here to check some different, you know, what was your heartbeat or other things uh, on the interface. You can see it. Besides that one, it will be, uh, compiling it the way that uh, first you have a control, second if you choose to monetize, you can monetize, you can earn money out of it. And coming to the Alexa's, WhatsApp's, WhatsApp even says uh, on last their privacy change, they also mentioned it. They were uh, pressured to mention it. Facebook said, we are analyzing your data and then sending it to the Facebook in order to retarget you back with the ads and the uh, same thing with the Alexa, same thing with the Siri. I mean, well, sometimes maybe you have come across, you talk about not typing, not searching anything. You just talk about something and then you start seeing it. It is because Siri actively listening. I've actually experienced once I was thinking about something. <laughs> literally, I have seen that, but I don't know what kind of apps is, is, is actually measuring my uh, uh, brain interference data, so that no, that's also- not quite I yet. Heard that might be right there. We don't know yet. That's scary. Um, no, th- this is great. And h- how, as a user, uh, can I monetize this data? Uh, you, uh, yep. So I give out all this on, on the app, and then I collect, perhaps, or I, I give permission and collect token. And how yep. does that work? Very simple. So the slogan is install, authorize, earn. That's it. So once you authenticate uh, these accounts that you have already, if that's what you choose to do as a user to monetize your data, that starts feeding that data into the database. 
and the pipes will be connected already to funnel that to these big data exchange partners that all the big data companies use. And we have an unfair advantage, so to speak, that in our real world data company, Hub UID, we've already formed all these partnerships. So whereas there are some apps out there that kind of try and do this, they're starting from zero. They don't have any of these partnerships. They're basically just starting with no users and trying to work their way up. But when you start with no users, there's no big data buyers that want to even talk to you. You have to be in the millions of users already. So we have been working on this. You know, we've been in the data business for years, forming those solid partnerships. So all we're doing with this, as we sort of decentralize the data company, is to connect the pipes to the existing strong partnerships. And so the the data monetization revenue will start flowing fairly quickly. And that's where it gets into this really cool, you know, autonomous type blockchain thing where we can't pay, nor do we want to pay the users in US dollars or euros, they need to get paid in our tokens. So that's the first time you see the swap token is that you authorize this and in your wallet, in the app, you start receiving swap tokens as your rewards. And they're like any ERC-20 token, they could be exchanged on Uniswap or anything you'd like, but it's unique how those are minted. So we don't, our system isn't creating them from nothing. Right now, today's the first day of our 30-day launch. Um, once the 30 days ends and we go live on Uniswap, all of the tokens are that will be minted are basically minted at that point, which means that every time the, the entity or the, the decentralized entity receives this revenue stream, it has to auto-convert it into swap tokens. So it, that, that produces a buying pressure. So that, that's one way of a number of ways that the token price is supported, stabilized, and should theoretically go up over time is that there's this additional constant buying pressure of the token through the data monetization that's being generated from this app just simply to do that conversion and to reward, to, to issue the rewards due to the end users. Uh, if you finish, I would like to add a couple things there. First, I will touch on the data monetization. Currently, we uh, you asked about the, how it will be monetized. Monetizing standpoint, let's say currently we have a client who has uh, what, uh, 1 million plus visitors on the website. They come, uh, we give them certain SDKs or the different scripts. Tracking. They you know, tracking scripts. They put on the website and then it gets, that data gets collected a digital fingerprint created for each visitor and matched to the our databases to see who that uh, person is. And besides that one, it collects the rest of his behavior data, compiles it now, and then have your ID infrastructure created that way that we push it to other marketplaces, data selling storefronts, we call them. And then like a live ramp or the na- uh, narrow, uh, we put it there and then any company wants comes by, selects for this uh, abc.com or any in website, selects from there, here is the audience. How much is that depends on how many per day you have a visitors. And then uh, that's how it works easily. Then money came in and the, mm, this website takes his portion after we deduct the uh, expenses and everything else. Same thing with swap. Swap is directly uh, will be um, data that you are authorizing and uh, giving for sale. Only that data will be compiled and pushed out of uh, to our partners. So any other company, not only our hobby IDs clients, but every other company will have access if you gave a permission. And uh, Additional to, uh, to that one, if you, uh, most of the money will be earned for a user it is going to be from the Chrome extension or the any browser extension you install. That way you can track a lot of things, you can control your settings and it will actively uh, collect the data, what you are doing, except excluding all sensitive information you put there, password, everything else, it automatically takes uh, even doesn't record. Even currently, we have different platforms that tracking the link shorteners, other things. 
uh, that kind of data never gets recorded. It's literally not right to do that. We don't have the right to do that. Even the user wants it. But uh, all that data will be created, hashed, and then sold. We don't, uh, system doesn't sell anybody your exactly words you typed. It just compiles, makes it, oh, you mentioned their uh, night. It will compile based on the AI and machine learning on the other end. It compiles and de defines which audience you will be related to. And that's how it sells. Yeah, exactly. That was actually my next question. So, uh, well, obviously data was um, a <laughs> has been, <laughs> data has been a very complicated and yes. controversial topic. Uh, we, we know data is the new oil, right? It's yeah. more than a trillion dollar industry. And then again, we have a lot of data, fragmented data, then different da data centers. And the problem is regulation. And at the top of that, um, the technology that doesn't or didn't exist before, perhaps machine learning or even like DeFi right now. Um, so your s servers, so you de is, is it a decentralized server that you have? Or Will be. Yeah, so yeah. right now we're still, the, all of the data still lives in the real world. <laughs> Uh, company. And as our token launches right now, and within probably, I don't know, three to four months, the app will be finished, will be launched on the iOS and Android store. And the long term goal is to decentralize as many parts of this as possible. There's IPFS solutions now. There's also, there are real ways, finally, in the blockchain world to actually run a hyperscale, you know, fast database fully on the blockchain. So that's the goal is to get there. Fully on the blockchain? Uh, fully on the, I, I want to add, there's a few companies I want to mention. Uh, Ocean Protocol, there's a data. Uh, right. in that, uh, mm -hmm. It is built for data. It is built for the storing the data and the dealing with data. We are going to, for the uh, swap has two parts. One, DeFi, that's a decentralized, basically money, uh, the tokens, gets a value on the use case we are launching. And second part is the app uh, or the web app or brow browser extensions. That part, we will be, uh, our goal is to get first onboard people and then start uh, creating everybody sensitive. First, we'll start PII data, personal identifiable data, fully transferred to the, uh, and stored on the blockchain. And then st starting from there, we will work on the creating different solutions, uh, storing rest of the data because storing data on blockchain, okay, it's easy. Uh, it's not that complicated to do that in comparison to then going and retracting that data back. Exactly. And you can't even change that problem. data. You can put it. You can update it, can you? Sorry? Yes, it can be updated. It can updates. It just change, it creates a new version chain connected to that one. Latest okay. version is the most updated one. It's basically and then you can do mine's new one. Mm -hmm. And uh, how, how is machine learning and AI and other technology and tools are playing uh, at uh, Swap? A lot. Oh. <laughs> there's, there's so many cool things. Mm -hmm. uh, so today, like just think about from the, the data standpoint of being able to have efficient targeting and showing your ads to the exact right person. I'm sure you've seen ads where it, where it seems disconnected. You're like, why am I even seeing this commercial? Or why is this ad? Where, like, So it's not a perfect solution today, but we represent the furthering along of that targeting capability to make it laser focused. So let's look at maybe like a car dealer. If a car dealer goes to one of these data exchanges and they say, I want an audience of people who are interested in buying a, a Mercedes because I'm going to run my Mercedes ads at them. They might buy a list from cars.com that say, here's a list of targeting IDs or devices that was on this page looking at this Mercedes. They're, they must be close to buying one. But I look at that page all the time and I'm not buying one. I just like the car. So that's the best they could do. But with this, what the machine learning does is it layers together, okay, what are all these different things from all these different sources doing with these people that are in common or show a stronger propensity or more in-market behavioral signals? So imagine instead of having just knowing the person was on this car website, to know that they were on the car website this many times within this many days on these different browsers, and they just had their credit pulled that we know from TransUnion at a Mercedes dealership yesterday and the GPS location that they 
voluntarily gave us from their device shows that their phone was at a Mercedes dealership yesterday. So there, there's all these different things that the machine learning can figure out by looking at the end results and then going back and seeing what did these people have in common? What were they doing? Right. I, you just mentioned that I remembered something. McDonald's is actually using that right now. So then they can track your GPS and they can track, obviously, your profile. And once you are close to one, one of the locations of McDonald's, all of a sudden a deal or a coupon shows yeah. up in your screen. Yeah. That, you know, this yeah. is crazy. Exactly. Uh, uh, and I want to mention one thing. I mean, people who is watching uh, this or will be maybe... And then from that standpoint that don't uh, get scared, Swap is not going to do it uh, just because, you know, like to do all these crazy things and learn everything about you. No, we all have to do it from the different angle. We connect with all five, six hour vendors. But at the same time, we get that information. While we are training that AI, we understand that instead of going paying five company that sells your data and the five times, why not to, it will be in one place and then instead of paying these guys 50,000 a month, 100,000 a month to each of them to get that data, why not to that data will be owned and sold by you. And that is the goal. And then if you don't want to, it will not do that. I mean, that, that's my goal is to, I don't want my kid in the future to not to have a solution to see their, hey, whatever she, like her privacy being invaded, it's really uh, one of the biggest problems for me. And I want a person to have a choice. Do I want to sell it? Do I want you to track me and my credit score and everything of ending up my location, where I want to eat, what I did, what I drove and everything without my permission, even though I don't know you are doing it. Because this is great. I'm just uh, actually signing up right now. So, <laughs> well, uh, so what's interesting too is that this is not only incredibly powerful, but by decentralizing it, it removes kind of like the need to trust us. Like, we don't want people to have to trust us personally. We want to prove that this is so decentralized and perfectly crafted and all the safety mechanisms are in place that users can feel confident that, like, you know what? I'd rather have this decentralized solid entity, you know, controlling my data where I can turn it on or off versus being, you know, having the tech giants control it where yes, I can maybe delete my Facebook account, but they're still going to track me any way they you can. Have to, you have to wait 14 days. Right. You cannot delete right away. Yeah. And I don't think they ever stop really tracking you. They might delete a few things, you know, from your phone, but they still know who you are and they still have a record on you. Besides that one, we added even on the currently on the auction page, you can see on the DeFi platform, we will have a warning system, which is already built. We will release it as well. If outside of roadmap uh, to take to some place, besides that one, if any change needs to be done to the swap app and as well as the swap, you know, DeFi platform, it will be uh, uh, put it on the vault on the open for a whole community, whoever owns a token can vote and decide if they want that feature, dot step, the contract, it will be done. Otherwise, it's not. And that way we want all the community get involved, not only us to build it. I uh, just don't have that much experience managing open source projects and uh, looking for the, you know, currently discussing and looking for different uh, developers who are, like-minded who will join the team and they will take it to more open source and that bring more value. I believe in one thing, more variety and the diversity you have in the team, better and much more creative it will get. And the unique product is going to come out of that one. That is the purpose of this swap. It's for everybody and everybody uh, just to protect something. That is exactly, and even Swap doesn't own your data. I would own, I would take you own fully data. yourself. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, what is the uh, the unique thing about the Swap protocol versus other DeFi projects out there? The thing, uh, <laughs> there's there's an obvious one. one. There's an obvious one. I would, oh, I I believe that DeFi is the coolest thing to ever happen to crypto and blockchain, but at the same time, 95% of these projects have no real world company behind them. You can go to SushiSwap and you can do things on the website, but 
what does it do in the real world? Nothing. What are, where's their real company in the real world? Doesn't exist. So I would, I don't know this for certain, but I, I would venture to say no more than maybe 10% of all of these DeFi projects in the entire world have a company, a real company behind them. So that I think is the biggest difference is that instead of us starting as, as code, as, as a smart contract, we started as a real company with a grand vision and we're decentralizing it and moving it over to a decentralized blockchain application. I think that's the biggest difference. And then of course, there's all the other cool things that sort of, it's like the all-star cast of everything, all the biggest launches from the last 12 to 14 months, we've sort of modeled the back end off of the best ideas. So it's sort of like an all-star system. So if you look at, you know, like the launch here, um, there have been a few projects that have done something similar to this, and it, it usually works very well. So this is an auction style launch, right? So the first day that this went live is today. So unlike the crazy ICO launches made popular during 2017, and some still happening today, fortunately or unfortunately, is that you can launch a token and there's really no way to incentivize people other than bonusing them or giving them more for free. And that usually creates a pump and dump type atmosphere. So to avoid that, by doing it this way, where you're, everyone comes in who wants to reserve swap tokens and they bring their Ethereum. So if I were to go to reserve on today, I can deposit ETH and reserve a certain number of swap tokens. And this is known as a 100% fair launch because if I come in with $50 or I come in with $5 million, the person, every, everyone in day one gets average based on your percentage of ETH that you put in. So if 5 million tokens are will be issued today, by the end of today, your percentage of ETH compared to the total amount of ETH is exactly how many of those 5 million tokens you'll get. And based on today's price of ETH, which is about $3,500, you, you could kind of guess how good of a deal you got on those tokens. So once this 30 days is finished, what happens is, all of that ETH that's being stored in this smart contract gets programmatically sent to Uniswap and paired with an equal amount of swap tokens. And that ETH slash swap pair on Uniswap is locked forever. And the owner keys are burned in the smart contract. They're programmatically burned. So nobody will ever control this potentially millions of dollars worth of ETH. And that does a couple of cool things. It locks the liquidity pool forever. The the 0.3% trading fees that any pool on Uniswap earns can't be taken out. So that actually grows the pool, the value of the pool without even any trading activity going on. And that produces what's known as a price floor. So unlike other tokens, we actually, there will be a lowest amount the token can ever go down to. And of course, it's still lower than the current price, but it can't actually ever go to zero, which is a crazy thing to think about that any token, even if there was a black swan event and every single token holder sold every single swap token at the same time, not only would every single person be made whole and receive their exchange, but there would be a minimum amount it could ever fall to. So there's lots of these cool things that we can make possible um, because of modeling the launch this way. And to start out with this big pile of ETH that's actually supporting the value of the swap token from day one. Right. And we're just talking about the first layer. I mean, as the project is developing, we will see different layers coming out. So yeah. Can you show even that we blocked it burn page and as well as the pools uh, here, for example, since the tokens gets, I don't like something to be a lot. Honestly, I mean, from that standpoint, we will, uh, since swap is going to automatically buy using a transaction fees and the other uh, initial revenue sources uh, that gets generated, uh, we'll be buying and uh, burning its almost half of its tokens uh, over the next year and a half, max two years we are trying to get there. Uh, half of its tokens, besides that one, it will additionally do, uh, what do you say? Uh, Buy an user holds a, holds a token on his hand, uh, basically. You put it on the liquidity pools, uh, pools, these yield farming platforms, they can uh, earn money. Let's say user earns swap token 
selling his data. And then instead of, if he doesn't need it, he can bring it, put it, let's say for last one, this swap pool. And uh, it will earn certain couple, uh, couple hundred percent uh, additional to his tokens, which, you know, adds more value. Today's day, your money sitting at the bank in dollars. I mean, every day you are losing 0 0.5, basically, uh, your value of your token annually goes down 0.5%. And then you're actually losing keeping it at the bank, unless banks are changing uh, the different model. Yeah. So, so there are more sorry. features I'm sort of going to be there uh, for the, this option. Everybody can, you don't need to, for example, invest money. You can click referral link and uh, create your referral link tied to your wallet and uh, share it, you are influencers, you can earn 10% of the whatever amount will be invested through that link to during the auction. And at the end of the auction, they will claim it. And uh, in previous projects who use this model, uh, some influencers have earned somewhere between uh, $50,000 to $258,000 just during so that 40 days. So basically it's an exchange data. We're yeah. talking about, yep. This, and uh, is it going to be also acting as a SaaS? So okay. that companies could subscribe, and since it is encrypted data, so then users like me, I can sell my data, for example, if LinkedIn wants to get in, just like get some analysis, right? Or uh, some... Not exactly. So that, exactly. Is, that is covered, it, it's kept secret by design for privacy reasons. So when the user clicks to authenticate, it'll just have a screen pop up and it's like, okay, log into your LinkedIn account. Okay, do you accept to share your data with Swap? Yes. Once that's authenticated, that the data just flows through the system. Like you don't see any of it, but there, there will be fields in your profile. Right. So as those fields that the data that is passed is updated, and you can see like, okay, is this your name? So like if a, if a woman's uh, last name changed because they got married, that might be wrong in the database. Maybe because right. our, our data might not be as updated as what they just did getting married last week as, as one example. So she could update her name if that isn't correct, if the middle initial is wrong, whatever. So there is, you do have some insight into the data that is into your profile that's living on the blockchain, but you don't see like a real stream of, you know, what's being passed. Uh, besides that one, I want to mention, I'm sorry, as I'm, uh, let's say you have your email address and over time we have a feature that will come on the stage three. On each of your data, you will see which company you connected using that data and which company is selling it without your permission or which company is using it for what purposes. All this will be done through the APIs. The day we will release the single sign-on feature, you can sign on, uh, sign up for any services, different places using your swap ID. Right. And that is the eventual where it takes that in one place, now you can control what they are going to sell and do you want to pass it to them or not? Right. So he Go ahead, sorry. You asked about kind of what the DeFi side can do. So this screen uh, might be a little hard to see. I'll make it bigger. Um, so there's three staking pools, and this will be unlocked after day 30 of our 30-day sort of pre-sale launch that we start today. So on June 8th is sort of the launch day where the token goes live on Uniswap, and these other features, the DeFi type stuff on the website, should be launched. So pool number one is purely a stable coin pool. It's, and each of these are sort of like decentralized finance products for three different risk tolerances. So someone who maybe is new with crypto or they want to dip their toe in the water or maybe a big institutional investor that doesn't want the price volatility of being in any token that can change, they can just be in USDC, Tether, DAI, or synthetic USD, all stable coins. And you can deposit any variety, any amount of those four into this pool, you'll see that the colors represent my share in the total pool balance and receive rewards in the form of swap tokens. So this one is probably gonna come out at about you know, 50, 60% APY, which may not sound huge in the crypto world, but when you compare it to a money market account at a traditional bank or a CD at a traditional bank, they're paying you like point 
8%. So to have no price volatility of the underlying asset because you're just depositing USDC or DAI or stablecoin, you could be in here a week, a month, a year, and it's not, it can't go up or down. The only thing that can change is the value of the swap token that you're receiving as rewards. So if you hold those, those could go up or down, but if you cash them out, then obviously you'd get whatever the equivalent amount was of the token you're swapping it for. So that's the stable coin pool. Right, and does the, uh, the number of uh, permissions for different apps that I provide uh, would add to the value of, or the number of the tokens that I receive, like the higher the number of yes. the apps I give permission? Yes, yeah. so that, question pertains to the smartphone side and I'll address that shortly, but it's important to realize that these two systems are totally separate from one another right. and yeah. they could both actually live without each other. We've paired this together just to make it an awesome you know, combination right. of things. So to answer your question, uh, yes, each each person receives a different amount of swap tokens depending on the value of their activity. So while we don't want to choose, you know, who's more or less valuable, what ends up happening uh, at the advertiser level is different advertisers are simply willing to pay more or less for, different apps. for to target particular users. It's no different than on Google AdWords. If you type in, uh, if you're a personal injury attorney or a DUI attorney, they pay $200 a click uh, for one click on when they run their ads on AdWords versus someone selling you know, an app might by, by be paying $1 per click. So what's the difference between one person paying $200 a click and one person paying $1 a click is the attorney could earn millions of dollars if he gets one case from right. what comes from those ads. So any advertiser in the real world uh, is weighing out their risk versus reward and how much they're willing to pay to target someone. Okay. So if you are a user and you install the swap app and you're just the average person who goes to the average websites, you're going to get an average amount of swap tokens. If you're a high net worth individual and you, you're, it's detected that you're looking at you know, a Ferrari website or you're looking at yachts to buy, there's going to be signals that indicate at the advertiser level, like, hey, this is a person that's worth more to advertise to. And therefore, there's going to be more high-end advertisers paying higher dollar amounts to advertise to you. They're going to pay more to have you in a list. Right. to advertise to. So therefore, if that generates more dollar revenue and that gets auto converted to the swap tokens, then you will receive more swap tokens. So then would uh, swap would be transparent to provide that kind of like activity or that kind of like um, analysis to the uh, to the users that, that perhaps, you know, it could could be noted. Uh, me as a user that I would uh, I would understand how the model works and if, for example it's also kind of like incentivizing me that for example if um, if I follow these kind of like steps or if I download these apps and if I increase my activity for, for example from 20 percent to 70 percent I might actually earn more even uh, though my yeah. my data is being protected would that be also something that you guys uh, you know that could open the door to people performing fake behaviors <laughs> to try and game the system. I mean, it's really, it's really not that much more in the grand scheme of things mm -hmm. because um, advertisers pay banner ad for banner ad impressions in a CPM or cost per mill. So for every thousand banner impressions, they're paying a few pennies. So even though the CPM rate to run an ad to someone looking at a Mercedes is much higher than running an ad to look at someone who's looking for a sale at Walmart, um, it's, it's more, much more expensive for the advertiser, but for the end user, that might be worth like an extra 0.2 cents. So it's not, it's not a huge difference. Um, but, but if everything you look at and everything you do and you land on checkout pages and receipt pages of Amazon for high ticket items, there's, there's ways to prove that you actually purchased stuff, not just looked at it. And that's going to be worth more. Um, and, um, uh, one quick answer on that one because of the each piece of the data has a different price because email has different price than the, your behavior data or how many times you use the internet what kind of things you exactly uh, search and uh, what audiences you are getting into each even audience has different price and from that standpoint yes the long story short the uh, plan is to show on the designs and the front ends we have all of the built that uh, 
user will be able to see while you are activating, giving a permissions, it will show approximately, but not exact, approximately your, if somebody would purchase full your data profile, which is oftenly happens for data analytics, for even retargeting to AI machine, uh, you know, machine learning algorithms, the companies are buying it before they get into analyzing this. If assuming one person, one company buys full uh, profile of each person to understand if this person living in this zip code, and in that case, how much your uh, data will bring you each time it gets sold. Sold means a through API, they will come take a copy of it. That's all. But any PII data, nothing will be sold uh, even if you want to sell your personal information, where it's illegal first and second, everything will be hashed, even your email addresses. Right. And, uh, uh, while you were saying that something came to my mind, it's obviously aggregated algorithms, right? Are you also looking into that uh, when you were thinking of swap? Uh, like uh, obviously like Facebook algorithms and like YouTube, Amazon, and how they actually react and collect versus how you guys are designing um, uh, or uh, yeah. looking into monetizing that. So each, the data sources won't share that proprietary information with us, but we have the luxury of creating our own sort of recipe or algorithm exactly. of what dictates the perfect, the ideal person to show any ad to. Mm -hmm. And that, like most machine learning, is reverse engineered. You take a group of people who ended up purchasing something and trace back all the places they went to before that and find things in common of mm -hmm. they all looked at this website and 82 percent looked at this website and i have an inter interesting story so zillow did this the huge real estate website they did an analysis of what the number one thing that everyone who ended up buying a house one website that like 80% of people looked at before end up buying the house and none of these data companies had this one website as part of their algorithm or recipe. And you know what that one website was? The sex offender website. It's the website you go to where you can put, you can type in an address and see if there's any registered sex offenders who live, <laughs> live around where you're going to. So imagine if you have kids, you can look at a lot of different houses, but what ended up happening is before they actually put an offer on that house, they check to see if there's any sex offenders oh. around there because they have young kids or, you know, whatever. Yeah. So that's, that's what true. machine learning and reverse engineering can uncover is what paths people take to get to a purchase. Yeah, uh, that's one uh, good point to show most companies to um, doing it reverse engineering everything here. Uh, since you said like, we are not going to have through even you verify your different accounts, different platforms, all the information they give. Therefore, that's the reason for you uh, to uh, install the browser extension in order us to see, you know, like you can uh, provide that data yourself that what I did on the Amazon. What I did uh, here, what I did in this, with think, which kind of things I looked at, and then all those, it will start creating different, uh, basically, uh, models uh, to identify the what ends up happening at the end, because all things like aggregated under one roof, just using that extension will help everybody, uh, you to earn more money, and as well as the algorithms to be much more cleaner and the much more precise of uh, coming to the point that trying to get the dirty data, clean it and go different steps. Well, definitely looking forward to, uh, to, to the information you're providing and the market share that you're taking away from, for example, all, all, all these big companies that are collecting the data, if it's not yeah. available right yeah. now. But in the Can market. we... I want to just data. one second. We are not trying to get the share of the data. Only... I, I understand, but the, they are using that data to uh, just for like third parties, right? And then this data is now being owned by by the owners and the users themselves. So yeah. definitely would uh, would have an impact on the market. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
Exactly. The best, the yeah. best thing that could happen is that in a year from now, this has so many millions of users on it, and so much of those users' data is now sort of democratized and put into a safer exactly. place that Google and Facebook start trying to figure out how do I buy out this company? Well, they right. can't because yeah. everybody owns it. But if they want to try and buy a bazillion tokens, then that's going to dramatically increase the price of everybody who's holding those tokens, including the millions of end users that have the app installed. It's the retail. Yeah, another thing, uh, if company, as I said, any feature you want to create will be voted by community to do as long as, same thing as creating something significant feature that can impact the future of this company. Therefore, we put it uh, in place, no one, individual entity or related parties can own more than uh can have as many tokens they want but they cannot have more than 10 percent voting power in order if they do own 60 percent of the tokens that in reality it's a 60 percent voting power no it's 10 percent voting power five percent uh, 50 percent that they own and will be increasing every leftover 40% that's uh, coin, each will have four times higher voting power. So they can compete against each other. Uh, so that's the one thing we added there for future purposes. Who knows what can well, happen? That's a great impact for sure. Uh, yeah. My last question, I don't know if it might be related or not, but like with obviously with the rise of fake deeps and um, deep fake, I mean, uh, videos and contents and also the bots. Uh, would that be also kind of like we, we're going to seeing some authenticated and unauthenticated contents or even like data um, that could be yeah. verified or not through your platform? Right. So that's where it's important to, to have a truth set, is what it's called. Mm -hmm. It's basically the single beginning point of what an account can be and how it's tracked. So we can only use identifiers that that are totally unique, like a device ID. So mm -hmm. if, if only one device ID can be linked to one account, then a bot or a malicious actor would have to have a bazillion phones in order to have you know, thousands of accounts. So we have every measure in place to try and you know, ward off those types of things. Um, could there be some type of, you know, bad actors out there that start gaming the system? Yes, but we think that our security protocols will be ahead of that. And besides, Perfect. not only device ID, you have to connect phone number, email address. It's a combination of few things. One profile can have multiple uh, devices. I have iPad, I have phone, computer, everything. Uh, it will be recorded in your profile in order to protect your data. But if you create a new uh, profile, from this one of those or any other uh, device for yourself, secondary data, you, you need to verify, first of all, you have to have a phone number, additional, mm -hmm. you have to have an email address, additional, you have to have, and besides that one, we match it back to the existing databases. If you never existed in this combination, I mean, it's fake. Right, right. Of course, uh, you can get creative and uh, we are working. Uh, it's not perfect. Then that might be uh, the solution for that. We can use NFTs for it. Yeah, oh. and actually there is, there is a excellent use case for NFTs, but it has nothing to do with art. So NFTs, what's really most in exciting to me about it is its ability to track the same person and to reward royalties to all of the parties along the chain that are due royalties. So in a system like this, where tracking the right people and who's using it, who's using you in an ad is essential. Um, wouldn't it be cool to have each person's identifier actually be also an NFT so exactly. that, so that mm -hmm. like Terrell touched on exactly. earlier, if you're only, if the only three companies are licensed to show ads to you and there's a hundred of them, then we know who the 97 are that are illegally showing ads to you or don't have permission to show ads to you. So that is the use case of an NFT, or at least one of them in a database system like this. Great. Thank you. It's all, it was all my question, but if you have further comments, uh, please. 
few things I want to add in the swap inside. It's just that not the data management app it's going to be. It will have your own swap pay system inside and it will be a wallet system inside and as well as that encrypted decentralized communities where you can, let's say you have an interest, uh, you select your interest on your profile that, hey, I, am, I like uh, playing bowling and then anybody uh, selects that interest group on their profile, it will become, basically you will be able to getting into that community having a conversation about with like-minded people and all the conversations uh, were truly uh, decentralized and uh, uh, encrypted that will be because uh, anybody eventually, as soon as we can make it open source as fast as we can, anybody will be able to come dig and uh, tell us that what we are doing wrong. And so, that is the why uh, I am thinking of additional things in the building a community, your own community, and at this uh, plus to that one NFTs we talked. NFT designers, creative people can design, you know, different NFTs inside and provide it. That is on our roadmap as well. Uh, they can sell. You will have your own business cards inside. You can they can create some NFTs unique and sell you as instead of giving somebody your uh, you know, business card, you can pass that NFT as a business card. Now, truly you can Of course, yeah. It's all sorts of applications for NFTs and that's even using passwords. Yep. And that's- Perfect, thank you. Sorry. And no, no, any, any more comments? Yeah, um, um, I want to thank you uh, just for your time and uh, taking the time and uh, discussing all this. And uh, hopefully it will be very uh, informative for the audience. And uh, Well, I actually learned a lot for sure. And uh, definitely look, looking forward to the lunch. Um, I, I wish that I had downloaded or there was a version on my laptop that I could download before this conversation. So then all these people are going to be pissed off at me, you know, all these companies. <laughs> no, so what? <laughs> because the, now they, they, they've realized that we all have been discussing about them. So, <laughs> right. so just want to let everyone know that today is the first day of launch. So anyone who's interested in reserving swap tokens could come to um, swap.org and click on get tokens, or you can come directly here, which is dap.swap.ee. And day one is right here. So all you need is a MetaMask wallet and ETH, and you can get tokens. Sounds great. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's, it, it's a really great project. Um, I can see there's like so much that you can scale it up. Uh, with different like layers out there I was just like thinking I mean since obviously like I have like four or five devices right and if like because it's kind of like an exchange that you guys are using a data exchange and why not using or like asking people for their passports like for example you know like all these like wallets and exchanges that we sign up they all require a passport so then you can just uniquely have only one person to be identified to uh, to that, I don't know, like how it could go with the what the kind of like legal aspect of it with your uh, uh, with your company, but also, and I was thinking that perhaps you can also add another feature on the platform that I would collect all these like tokens, and um, if if I want to con convert them to Ethereum or not, but then I would just loan them to you guys, and then I would earn interest, and then perhaps you can have kind of like monetize that one in another way. Yep. So uh, we have depends. we have that here. So I mentioned this first pool is for stable coins. So if you have USDC or DAI or Tether or synthetic USD today, you can lend them or deposit them, stake them on the swap platform and earn interest. If you have no, Bitcoin. I mean, the, the swap token itself, so then mm -hmm. it could add value or like it would increase the price of the token itself, not just... So yeah, lend, like, lend out swap tokens? Possible? Yeah. Right. So w we actually are forming a partnership or integration with Compound right now. Mm -hmm. And currently that will only be through or for earning extra interest on the stablecoin pool. But as swap becomes more popular and is in more circulation, it's very likely that 
Compound, Venus, maybe even Coinbase start offering or adding the swap token as a collateral option? Besides, when I want to mention one thing, your data, let's say you need $5,000 today and then all of the year you are using swap. And we know that per month you approximately earn from your data uh, around $1,000 with your company data and everything else, your browser extension. And uh, be using that since everything is verified and uh, you are a swap user, you need a $5,000 and then you will be able collateralizing your six months earning or the 12 months earning health of each earning and the taking that 5,000 ahead of time if you are holding other assets here. It's like a, it's like a, a crypto cash advance loan. <laughs> exactly. Um, and you know, another thing. think uh, all these globalists, I mean, I'm not against climate change, but this is off the record, right? We finished the interview. So um, like all these globalists are talking about climate change and how much we are contributing to the, uh, to the environment in terms of emission and so forth. But they never talked about like how much data we are producing per day or even like per yeah. seconds, right? Um, and, and, and imagine if we look at this way, um, it's also another contribution to the climate change or whatever that they call. But I mean, th that would be a really great, um, I mean, consumer ads for you guys if you want to use that. <laughs> That yeah, produce. I mean, like, but but then I don't know how much data we produce per day. Like, obviously, it's like tons of data. It's tons. And imagine, yeah, imagine how could that be? But also, what is the application for the health data? Because health data is very. Like I, I work with another project. There are kind of like encrypted the, the health data, like genetic mm -hmm. data and so forth. But right. obviously, when when it comes to working with all these like silos of data or even yep. like the data owners like mm -hmm. different layers come the governments local like so yep. for example within one country even like within eu mm -hmm. we have gdpr each country in the eu is managing their own health data it's unique and then you go for example to the netherlands netherlands the hospital owns the data and then you go to the hospital there's so much complications there the professors that are doing research for example in pathology neurology and genetic uh, DNA sequencing, they all have, you know, like legacy data. They don't yeah. even use that. They don't even know how to do that because they have to convert it to VCH files or whatever yep. that they have to convert. So what is this, like you guys also offer a solution to that or that would be kind yes. of really something? So we want your record in Swap, your profile to be a, the single source globally for everything about you because the more that you authorized to put in there it's being safely stored on the blockchain and but everyone i don't own that data that's the problem the hospital yes owns right that data. so so today there are certain uh accounts that will plug into a third-party application like the one we're building and uh -huh. so the the first step to get to where you want to be and we want to be in there too is to have maybe the first big in insurance companies that have some connector that enables other systems in a safe way to communicate, that would be the most obvious first place to start. Mm -hmm. uh, until that we get there, until the world gets there, um, another way could be perhaps individual companies or organizations or hospitals could start creating connectors that make it possible for us to connect directly to them. But doing it individually like that would be sort of a mess. There, there really has to be like yes. hubs. Yeah. So yeah. I, th I think there are companies like that, that are data companies that are trying to focus on healthcare and create those hubs that can be connected to. I know a few companies uh, that is doing it, that connecting that data. It is not uh, in you, uh, on the GDPR, uh, everything about the person. If even doesn't matter you are a hospital or you are, whoever you are, but if you have my data, if I gave you permission, uh, you might own the rights of the result, but I own my data. If I ask you, if you are a hospital event, delete my data, I don't want to deal with you, delete it. You must delete it. And then uh, from that standpoint, every person will have a uh, basically right or the place to log in, let's say in US, my chart. Uh, you will be able to log in uh, my chart as long as, as soon as we feel that we are HIPAA compliant and these can handle that data 
security at every standpoint. And after that one, we will allow users to import their, uh, connect their MyShard account, it is, and import that data. And you own, even the, in Europe, in most cases, there are few uh, exceptions is there, but in most cases, it's a user has a right at least to the second copy of the data because that so, you own it. I'm based in Canada, right? And I'm Canadian citizen. I don't own my data. I have to request my health data from my yeah. practitioner, which is family doctor, or the person that did generate that data, either, for example, if it was a psychologist or if, even if it's a dentist. So I have to ask them to release that data. And sometimes they ask me, why do you need that? So right. this is ridiculous. So, I mean, that's obviously, it's kind of like a regulatory, you know, framework. Yep. Uh, it's, it's out Europe, of our... Mm, so. Yes. So, <laughs> like yeah. most... Uh, in Europe, they are doing it. Uh, but the solution over there was found that a uh, few startups and then it got backed by the government as well. They are consolidating industry data. Consolidating industry data to provide users, let's say hospital, Hospital data, if I go from this hospital to another hospital, my data, uh, my background, whatever happened to me on my medical records needs to be available directly to this doctor here automatically as soon as it has to be centralized, connected system. So I don't have to wait three days to have an appendix surgery and that, that my doctor doesn't know what the hell happened yesterday or the three months ago. Mm. So yes, that's a regulatory, but regulation wise, every user has a right to do it, but it's not there yet, but definitely it needs an initiative by the you know, young companies who can push and get crazy ideas out there. Mostly they say, ah, oh, you're gonna fail. Yeah, 90% of time you will fail, but one or few of them of creative ideas comes and uh, succeed, succeeds. And that success is brings a little change to the whole industry's perception right. how it should work in the future. But definitely count on me if you guys are working on that solution too for the health data because um, I'm already involved with that. We're building something, a pipeline in like we're building different pipelines right now in the health, but also we're uh, kind of like working with the Netherlands government right now. So there's like so much mess going on there, but. Yeah, uh, once we, you guys are launching that, that would be definitely interested. To we'd definitely be interested better. in that. If if there yeah. is there a company we can look at their website that's kind uh, of you can, yeah, you can check shivom.io, uh, I O S H I V O M. That I O. And uh, we're also getting into NFTs, so mm -hmm. health data, you know, NFT like DNA. Mm -hmm. um, they are getting into NFTs? Well, I, I'm working with a couple of projects. I'm working with Anton that introduced me to you guys uh, on NFT marketplace they're launching, but also the health industries. I mean, I mean, with all these like vaccine passports, it would definitely make sense to have an NFT using NFT uh, solution to that. Obviously it's already authenticated and verified. And like, I don't even, I don't know what kind of vaccines I had, you know, taken in the past. So I, every time I have to go do a kind of like a complete blood test to see what my immunity is versus different viruses or diseases, right? But with NFT, I already know how, like, for example, what my vac vaccination, not just for COVID itself, but like, for example, for chicken pox or any other kind of like other, stuff so uh so obviously there's like so much um solution or so much application for or use cases for nfts in the health health care even like every every industry but um but yeah but the, the main purpose is uh with, with, with this uh, company building a kind of like a marketplace for the data and uh, they also have their own token um basically they want to be the health care token you know uh that could kind of like take over the uh, Kind of like the economy that right. is managing the health data but it's, a, it's kind of like a break uh breakthrough but it's also comes with a lot of challenges for sure but it would be interesting to see perhaps if we can do a uh, kind of a collaboration with you guys that is what i was thinking of the, you know it's uh this kind of changes in the user data and industry there's so many aspects uh out there that uh, one company or one team uh you know, being a successful from the beginning would be really hard, but the combining the 
forces and partnership and uh, bringing it to the life, yes, that would be. Yeah, like for example, we would have the health data to give to you guys, you know? Yeah. In the collecting the other data. And work with each other and uh, yeah, merge something, but I don't know how. So obviously you have to work on the token economics, but like, there's also another yeah. discussion that they might kind of like create a new system uh, for the token economics that they because the, we launched back in 2017, 2018. Yeah. Uh, and now with the DeFi, obviously there's a different model. And with the NFTs, we definitely have to restructure and kind of like pivot that kind of like ecosystem too. But then it's kind of like we have Shivam Ventures, which is basically the startup that is working on the pipelines. And then we have Shivam, which is the token, the mm -hmm. OMX. Um, which is OMX is the health data token. So yeah, definitely would be interesting. I can definitely create a introduction uh, group chat on Telegram to see how we can work together, but probably not in the next uh, week or so because you guys are busy with the launch and everything. But yeah, definitely, yeah. Would be so uh, the, the the one challenge that exists in in combining other any two databases is mapping the, the fields. It's creating a standard that says, hey, this company calls your, I don't know, <laughs> heart rate this name. And this health company calls your heart rate this field name. So it's, it's creating, okay, if we, if we agree on what to name that field, it, okay, now two of us agree. But is this also going to be agreeable to every other healthcare company in the world that wants to also integrate and call this their heart rate field so it's creating like what are the base fields what's the standard we're creating and how well, likely is it like the rest of the world right yeah well, we, <laughs> not not really the rest of the world all the other health com healthcare companies in the world that we would the health insurance companies anyone who would be feeding data into that same field it needs to be accurate that the data that they would send into that field we call heart rate or last known heart rate or current heart or whatever that is um is the same data from all the sources. Right, but uh, I think that the, the main priority would be partnering with the hospitals that have, like, because they have the, the primary data, they have the raw data, right, that, that matters. Then we can use machine learning and AI to analyze that. And then that we can create the pipeline to, to do di diagnostics um, and the diagnostic research and everything, right? And then all these insurance companies and even pharmaceutical companies, drug companies would come to that because they want the data and we have the platform. And even like, for example, the DNA sequencing kits, when you sequence your DNA with 23andMe, you don't really get, you just get kind of like a percentage of your ancestry, but you don't get, for example, your, um, your biome or like your genetic information, or if you have a, like a, if you're prone to diabetes or cancer or any, anything running mm -hmm. inherently in your company, in, in your um, ancestry family. or your family, right? But then with this, it obviously is kind of like a comprehensive look at because we have the raw data and then we use all these like machine learnings and even like combining all these like GVAs and different pipelines, then you do cross research and obviously you can get a better field, a better kind of like spectrum of the data. And then all these like doctors and professors just looking at the sequencing of the DNA and then analyzing it with different kind of like cross kind of like research that they do cross analysis based on different pipelines. They can just say, for example, you have SLS mm -hmm. uh, because I was actually, I was, I was in Netherlands last month and I was talking to like a couple of professors there. They have all the silo data, but obviously there's like a regulatory environment that is kind of like a hurdle there because they cannot release it to us. We are not, well, we are doing a partnership right now to become kind of like an EU, to have an EU presence. So then we are also GDPR compliant. So that, and then if we have a local server server there, we would be under their fire, within their fire kind of like wall, then they don't have to leak that data. The, everything is central. We would just, we wouldn't even own the data. It's the platform. They enter the data, we encrypt it. We create the kind of like the file that would, is readable for these like doctors and like uh, professors, and then we create the pipeline, and then that that there we go. It's so much easier. But then it's just like so much process, right? So, but then insurance companies, how do they get the the data? I don't know. I don't even care because I'm going to the source of the data that is actually because there they have labs 
they have the patients, they have the cancer patients that they collect the data immediately there. It's fresh and I can just onboard it on, on the server there that is kind of like, you know, my computer. I have a presence there and then it's, it's boom. Insurance would come to me and ask for right. that data, right? Cool. Because I don't even know how old the insurance, like the, the data that they're owning or holding on to how old it is because with the healthcare, I mean, like not with the genetic because your genetic data doesn't change. But with the other health care information, the data changes all the time. That's why you have to have a, a track record. Like, mm-hmm. for example, if you did your blood pressure yesterday, doctor recommends you do it today at the same time, you know, or yep. like tomorrow. We need that, right? And that's a cool thing about one of our integrations on our roadmap is to integrate with Fitbit and to, with Apple Watch. And imagine your profile knowing in real time, like, wow, his heart rate's really high. And it looks like he just went to the doctor and these mm. things were found. Putting those that information together could actually give you like real time, you know, understanding of this person is going to have a heart attack soon or something. Exactly. And also we're working with athletes, right? So we have like, um, well, two, t- two years ago, we were working with this like Olympic athlete and he was also saying like what kind of problems they have and they have to do like, because he's a professional athlete, a runner um like two times a thing uh uh gold uh winner but then they have to do weekly blood tests and this is not really i mean it's not because the whole like thing changes and it's not sustainable for them they they need a better system and they need a better track like they don't they use like excel sheets right <laughs> Mm-hmm. You don't really you you don't really need that. You need algorithm because these these guys are professionals. And at the same time, you need that data to be anonymized because it's so competitive. If, yeah. if for example, you know, like uh, Mayweather is boxing against you know Mike Tyson, if he knows what his performance is uh, before the match, they can you know always change that. Like it's all about like you know competitivity and all these like. Uh, competition too um and even like this same diet what kind of diet these guys are they're like yeah. they're very very you know kind of like uh, cautious of releasing that data but then imagine that data has been being anonymized and then you can compare all these athletes performance against each other but even we don't know who's who but it's it adds up it adds a lot to the uh to that industry, which is multi-billion dollar industry, or even like we were talking to a diet company based in San Francisco by like the guy is a very influential, like he's been an opera and everything when the founder and they do like um, kind of like wide label solution. But at the same time, they're using a lot of like AI um, uh, for kind of like creating the customized um, like diet I- yeah, AI. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that data is very important. I think they partner with one of the biggest gym in the U.S. I don't know what the name is. Uh, um, with like nine million uh, gym goers. What, yeah. what, are, what is the LA one? Fitness Gold's yeah. Gym? And you opened that uh, link I sent on the message. I can introduce you guys to this company, DG. Uh, one of our investors on Swap, uh, early investors when we started building app. Uh, they are investing in this company. I know these guys from UK. And this company is consolidated all the, if you download this app available on the App Store as well, you will see uh, your uh, what data they have available and then where you can log in. All US, my charts, everything else, you log in, they compile that data. Now, another apps, uh, there's another healthcare analytics app that builds on top of the data that they are collecting uh, with the user uh, connects here and for control purpose only. Now uh, they don't uh, give um, basically money or anything to you. Just you see what's going on, where's your, all your data in one place. Uh, they just added the social media as everything else, but they are well known. They got really good investment last year uh, for the d- healthcare side, uh, mm-hmm. in you, they're located. And then you said it's not possible to do, but because you as a company coming to that hospital from outside is not possible. But if the user, everybody else will come connect their 
data source, doesn't matter healthcare or anything, as long as this is HIPAA compliant. This yeah, the problem is they don't own it. Uh, like like in, in, for example, like in the Netherlands, you don't own it. Hospital owns it and hospital doesn't release it. But, but I think there's, there's a difference. Like, yeah. I think there's a difference and a little bit of a misunderstanding. We, even in the U.S., I have to go request my health records and like sign okay. a form and everything. But mm -hmm. once I have it, I do own it because I'm holding it. So I, I think that's then, the difference. Yeah, I no, no, I, t I totally get it. But then imagine how hard it is to educate oh. people. <laughs> you know, I have to, I have to tell them. Can you request that from your government? And for example, the case in the Netherlands, we have a lot of issues. First of all, they're not really ambitious. I mean, yeah. the ecosystem is not, not like. And then they don't speak English. I mean, they they speak English, but mostly Dutch. And then they're like, "Who are you?" Are you a Dutch company? It's also that kind of like, I don't know, mm -hmm. I don't want to say racist, but race factor. Yeah. But it is so much easier to work with the businesses B2B than B2C because we did evaluate that. It's like so much hurdle because now I have to be kind of like, it has to be a peer to peer, yeah. a company to an, like an individual, which is GDPR compliant. Like I have to go, have to sign a lot of legal things and they can sue me because if they don't understand one clause and then they say okay you violated my my right and you violated my data then i'm screwed you know but then dealing with a hospital is so much easier because then we would have an understanding it would be based on for example the research not even kind of like monetization of their data right yeah. it, it would be creating kind of like a solution for the hospital which is currently having they have issues they have silos of data they have legacy data they can't even read because those platforms have been for example specifically cgis have been um acquired by chinese governments or sorry by chinese companies in yep. in, in the field and nobody can work with the china right but then i we bring that kind of like api we bring that kind of like solution so then yes we can work with them but then we have to be compliant with them so yep. it's it's so much like healthcare I've been working. It's interesting, but it's it's very complicated. Yeah, it's frustrating. Yeah. So I think yeah. I think you'd probably agree, and you touched on this. The best way to disrupt something that's insurmountable, like is 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 to build a product and a database and a platform so big that you just can't be ignored anymore. Exactly. But, it's the elephant in the room, you know. <laughs> right. And like literally everywhere I go, I bump into that elephant because I know that's a problem. So we have to remove it. Or, that is really hard right now uh, to find. If you can make people lazy and uh, give them ready results easily, everybody will start to use it, even if that would be against law or law eventually will be adapted under it. I take it from uh, every successful company, every successful uh, platform that was launched made us some way somehow lazier exactly it made also, more lazier it's gonna be i'm gonna use it more and that's all it and scarcity i think if, if you make it complicated um, if, if we we make it limited and then i think it comes with the value right, right. Um, and, and and the more mysterious it is i mean look at people are buying dogecoin like <laughs> i i talk to people literally <laughs> I talk to people, they're like, oh, do you do cryptocurrency? Like, even like I'm in Dubai right now for a couple of conferences and like, like you know, there's so many, not uneducated, but like regular people not active in the blockchain. I'm like, do you know what cryptocurrency is? Like, yeah, I have Dogecoin and yeah. I have Ethereum. I'm like, are you kidding yeah. me? Do you have any Bitcoin? I'm like, no, right. just Dogecoin. It's, it's a general ignorance <laughs> of the industry. It's, it's general, but at the same time, I mean, look, it's just the meme. And then, I mean, like, look, look at this and everybody owns that. And now everybody, every exchange is listing it like yeah. blockchain.com wallet. They just listed it last night. Yeah, I'm like, are you kidding well, me? Well, Dogecoin does have a huge market cap, and that's just simply because it's been around for so long, and now it's because of Elon Musk pumping it. It's, I think it could it's crash ninety percent on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, we'll see. I, I, I don't, I doubt it because it's just keep going up, and as long as he's bringing that concept, yeah, we're going to the moon, and we're bringing, you know. Shiba dog there, so probably yeah. it's gonna go. So, the moon. question about this platform. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Is 
we, we do see, we've always talked about having these profiles be as complete as possible and incorporating health data into it in a secure way is, you know, has always been on the roadmap. Is, is there a way to, you know, partner now with this to at least like start figuring out what those fields should be and to figure out how we could connect perhaps? Because what oh, with, we are using, swap project? Yeah, this she will, uh, your mm -hmm. project that you are working with. Uh, yeah, for sure. Well, um, because we had a call today, kind of, kind of like we've, we've been working on, obviously with the DeFi rising, uh, we might actually change the product. Well, we have a different product too, and but then we, we need to change everything. We need to reset probably the token. So it has to be finalized. So it's like this website and all these features might change. But I think the best way would be because we're in the process of changing and pivoting uh, using the token economics and like obviously the token has to jump up. Uh, perhaps I think it would be better to, uh, to set up a, like another group chat on Telegram because all these are going to be updated and I don't mm -hmm. know how this is going to be updated, but usually how we go with the partnership is uh, well, like if, if you guys want, we do sign, you know, NDAs and then we discuss like how perhaps we could kind of like where the common sense is or what the common work for us is. So, since you guys are dealing with the data, you don't own, you don't have data, health data, but then we, we have like different pipelines. We have GLAS and we're working, for example, with kind of like UAE, um, like some clinics, for example, in Kuwait to get, you know, genetic data. And then, for example, we'll be working with India. Um, it's kind of like massive, massive genetic um, information so that that probably would be a kind of like a different game changer for what you guys are doing um so i think the best way if you guys are interested we can do a kind of like a telegram um like an introduction because all these is going to change like this website and everything it's, it's going to mm -hmm. change okay. in the next couple of days yeah so mm -hmm. i wouldn't we talk about it we can start conversation and then get at least one meeting in a couple of weeks or the week later just after it slows down, today is uh, open. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we can definitely do that. I can do the introduction the, later. The reason is, uh, Swap, yeah, eventually we have a feature that this company is doing the, all this consolidating health data, everything else, consolidated in one place for every comp uh, country. And but then you can transfer the health data to us. We could be the health data yeah. partner. Every right who just purchases from Swap will have access to that because Swap has like data monetization uh, part and data purchase section where the right. company creates an account on the website and then uses API integrate to Swap and then she purchases Swap token pays it. Now every uh, data sold here gets uh, the same data gets be if you are the owner of this data, it will come back to you. But, that's why I mentioned at the beginning, your user profile, at the end, you have a company profile. I'm an entrepreneur, my profile I'm selling, and my company generates a lot of data. What about I will make another source of revenue out of it? Right. And do you guys have a marketplace? Yes. No. Will be do you have a marketplace? Uh, third stage, probably January, will be opening. Then. But then we have a marketplace, so we can merge the marketplace. We don't have to build. Yeah, or, you know, mm -hmm. rented, so then you could, you know, there's a lot of the and then yeah, then the tokens could. But I think the, the most important thing would be that how we can work on the token economics to uh, you know kind of like create. Obviously, you have swap token, and then you have OMX token, which which is going to be changing obviously with different structure. So I think the most important thing would be how can we work around how the token uh, might be affected here, and like how to kind of like create that kind of like utility. There's a couple of ways. Someone could earn two, or they could. We could have a, an exchange occur, where exactly. where we're basically purchasing the equivalent value of your token programmatically, and then that yeah. gets burned, and then they yeah. receive the equivalent and swap, or vice versa. Exactly. And if you guys are interested in the NFTs, you don't really have to reinvent that. Uh, working with another company that they already are providing white label solutions, so then you can just use that and then also their platform uh we're launching a couple of nfts it, uh, first i think it's only with stars like we're i mean i, I can i can say that uh, mm -hmm. we're working with a, a member of a royal family um in europe that the, he's very involved in the 
active um, uh, tech ecosystem. So it's not just about royalty, but it's about like how they are like striving in terms of bringing their tech economy, you know, um, to the to the world, uh, kind of like stage, and also Europe. Yep. And then we have DJ Player that probably we're gonna drop a couple of NFTs on her, and then we're gonna be talking, or we're gonna be working with Howard Bloom. Um, so he uh, he's a great philosopher. He worked with Michael Jackson and Joe Joe Price and all these like yeah uh, uh, legendaries back in I think 1980s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's been yeah he's been a very great influential. But then he had like a lot of great limited records. So we're we're looking to see how we can use that. So yeah, we are also we, working. We in do that. so if our primary use case, as I touched on earlier, for NFTs is tracing. So the, the best thing to single identifier that all advertisers use is this MAID, mobile advertising ID. We call it the MAID. If we could create, have a platform that takes each one of these MAIDs in our database and creates an NFT out of it that enables us to trace the use of that MAID across the entire ads ecosystem, that's like a billion dollar idea by itself. Exactly. And then... And then you can track how much revenue that NFT made, right? right? Because you can track it. And then I can, I can auction that NFT because that NFT had, for example, if it created like $1 billion revenue, so that NFT has that much amount of you know, value. Yep. And then there's another platform I'm working with that you can, you can lend against your NFT. <laughs> so, yeah. so this is this is like mind blowing. Yeah. Like you put your NFT there, and then you can lend against it. So yeah. it's just like your earn interest rate. So, so why why not buy a seventy million dollar painting NFT if you can borrow fifty percent against it? Exactly, it's like kind of like putting your Bitcoin in block buy, you know? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so like, and Abe obviously Abe um, uh, is one of their investors. So it's just, it's just like. What is actually happening in DeFi is like just mind blowing. I hope it's not just the hype, you know, yeah. uh, that comes back every two years, but hopefully it would just stay uh, this amount of craziness that is going going happening in, in, in the market. But like definitely would, would like to see how we can work together. What I can do, I can do an introduction with Dan, who's, who's running the NFT and you can ask that question mm -hmm. if you can, you know, about the MA, AMA. Made, M-A-I-D. ID. And I'm sure that they can do that because they're providing this white label solution to anything for NFTs. They can. Um, is, is that on, yeah. does it run on Ethereum or a, a cheaper Multi -chain. blockchain? Multi-chain? Multi Good. Because it would have it's to be on Solana or one that has, you know, very, very cheap transactions. Because like this would be like a bazillion transactions. Yes, exactly. But no, I think it's um, multi-chain and they're also, if you Google space swap, so it's a milk token. So perhaps yeah. they can. Uh, yeah. We know that one. Yeah. So it's uh, it's the uh, the platform by uh, by space swap. <laughs> yeah, it's Anton's project, obviously. So. No, we have a good. Yeah, we're launching the NFT store. So so. So yeah, I mean, there's like there's so much uh, so much thing you can do, but I, I really like the idea of that um, the NFT within the the data and the mm -hmm. traceability aspect of that. Um, but uh, as as yeah. long as my name is not there. My main goal was, to, my main goal was with the NFTs and eventually creating, as Joe mentioned at once, a uh, unified ID of the person globally. You can tag there, basically put scan and put your copy of your each passport, every document. So with that NFT only, depending on where you are using, as you said, KYC. If you present that one, you sign up with that single sign on, depending on where you are signing up, if it is wallet or the NFT, if you signed up for that wallet system, or the exchange with this swap sign on. In that case, you don't need to provide anything because this ID already it pulls and verifies. APIs will be able to transfer in that information to them without giving you hard time to scan and put face everything else. And the swap will do. I mean, if you want not to every time to scan your face, 
if this is your app, your verification, one time you did it, Swap will confirm that this is the same person. Basically, you don't need to. And maybe your genetic ID is also part of your unique identifier. If we could make these systems come yeah, together. A lot of things. Yeah, exactly. We're we're working on celebrities DNA NFT. But that that was something that I, I didn't want to get involved, but we'll we'll, we'll see how that is. I, I, who's for example, who's gonna buy? George Clooney's DNA NFT. Would Somebody wants to that? clone him. Uh, DNA. Yeah, and, like he, DNA. he was in the. Who, nobody cares about celebrities anymore. Pumps with the DNA itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like his data is important. Like I would use that for the healthcare, but like just making a JPEG of his like NFT, like I mean DNA for NFT. I mean, yeah, that's I mean, that's I mean, stupid. Let me see how my DNA looks like. <laughs> But with oh, the okay. Doge, I, mean, I don't think any idea is stupid anymore. So probably we can, we can but I, th I think a great idea would be that if we can create the, the Shiba DNA code, I mean, NFT for, for the doc and then sell mm -hmm. it as a, yeah. And then that would be genius. It would sell a lot. Yeah, for sure. I think All right. point dollar, paper dollar will become an NFT. Hopefully government thinks about it and makes it before everybody else before well, there, yeah, they, they, they will. I, I'm sure that now with the Gov uh, coin, like UK is launching a Gov coin, like all these guys are going to get into that and then they're going to own us again. So I think I don't, I don't see a, a point in decentralization anymore if the Gov coins, you know, kind of like enter the market, but we will see. But and, well, you can choose not to use them. Money laundering. Yeah, I, well, I, I would never choose them. But then imagine if they say, okay, you know what, each exchange, is, which is happening right now in Turkey, if you are withdrawing 1200 from the exchange, you have to report it to the government. I mean, the exchange will have to report it to the government. So this mm -hmm. is like, they, it's kind of like, you know, yeah, this, this is crazy. I mean, here in US, in Canada, in Europe. It's yeah, 10,000. Yeah, well, each okay. transaction get red flagged, but if it's more than ten thousand, obviously the, the Canadian uh, revenue agency would, would you know would, would get that. But but at least like I know I wouldn't be withdrawing. But then imagine if they want to take custody of my Bitcoin, so that would mm -hmm. be also different. Because now the Canadian court, the Supreme Court, has required some exchanges to um, to report that. So it's kind of like I mean, I think I'm going yeah. to Mars now. So I'm looking no. for, uh, to see how they are going to control decentralized exchanges. You don't need a real exchange to do all those things. Yeah, no, but there's this uh, coin square exchange that they're, I think they're working with Hong Kong. That's why they have to uh, kind of like report every time that they do that. Kraken just lost a lawsuit against I IRS won the lawsuit against the Kraken yesterday. Uh, now Kraken has to send all the user customer data to the IRS to US. Yeah, Coinbase does that. Yeah, what well, they do from Coinbase. Coinbase. Yeah, the Coinbase does that, and before even like being IPO, right? Uh, PayPal does it. Like all these, like I mean, yeah, that's the problem with the government. Like, if you have a license, you have to deal with that one. You have to report it. I mean, there is no other way. I mean, you must report it if you have a license. We are getting a license in Switzerland right now for the swap as a money mm -hmm. bank license. Swap will have a bank card, debit, credit cards, everything else you can use without taking your money to any other exchange. Uh, that uh, for that purposes, we are getting it. Uh, already is kind of first week of the June, uh, first, second week of the June will fully will be transferred legally everything from Estonia to uh, Switzerland based on that license. And uh, over there, you have to, if you have that license, FCA, you have to comply with FCA and money laundering, KYC, everything else. And all your transaction has to be passed along to any government uh, you are getting a license with US. If you want a US people to invest in that one, you have to pass it. Yeah, exactly. And so I, that was another question. Where are you guys based in? Uh, I mean, like legally, you've been incorporated in. Estonia. Estonia? Yeah. Uh, Estonia? Yeah. Next month, it's going to be switched to the Switzerland Zurich. Well, the former prime minister of Estonia was our, our early advisor for Shivan Project, Tabby. 
Cool. Yeah, advisor to Everest ID as well. Uh, he's advisor to Everest ID. Yeah, the, ID Everest Talk. ID. Oh, okay. I need to. We are compiling that government data, our uh, user data as well. That's also data they have. Yeah, he's, he's very innovative. Uh, obviously, he kind of like created the e-residency. But anyway, it was great talking to you guys. I'll definitely do the introduction with Shivam. And if you want for the NFT, I can do that. But since you already know Anton and uh, NFT star. But who's going to edit this? Is that Anton's group? Uh, we will. Uh, we have person can edit it. Uh, what portion you need to be edited? Uh, this, of course, um, portion after the YouTube stop. Yeah, so uh, on your discretion, as long as like these conversation off the record is not being there, so that would be perfect. It's going to be off the record that we will cut it. And then my answer, describe yourself, wasn't good at all. Yeah, so because, I mean, this is swap, right? So I, I was just like interviewing you guys and asking questions. So if, if you don't like one section, I mean, no, no, no. I mean, the, you uh, you make the decision, show is yours. I mean, stage is yours. I'm not going to touch anything. I know, but no, I, I don't really. I, I really like everything, but then there might be some like pauses. So yeah, then right. just like that with the, uh, the edit. But but yeah, I mean, it's, it's up to you guys. If yeah, you we can get somebody, edit that one, or connect it with you, give the file to him so you... So, I mean, and I know Anton does that because I'm working with another podcast with them. Um, so their team does that. But I don't know if he's he's doing that or not. But, but yeah, I'll, I'll ask him if he can get in touch with you guys. So then we can you yeah. can decide. I don't I don't have any problem. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Then thank you very much. I really thank you.